This chapter examines the reason for investigating firefighter fatalities, injuries, and near misses, as well as the advantages and components of a near miss reporting. The reporting process, the elements of building a sexual system, and the distribution of information. Our objectives. Explain the reason for thoroughly investigating firefighter fatalities, injuries, and near misses. List two reasons for thorough investigations and describe the causes for injuries and the different injury pattern theories. Define hindsight bias and explain how it affects events that have already occurred. Explain the advantages of enemy in the near miss reporting process. Explain the disadvantages of voluntary reporting as it applies to near miss reporting. Describe the process of near miss reporting along with information needed and list the five leverage points that can be used when implementing a safety system and explain how sharing information can reduce future in the line of duty deaths. Now, few words invoke more fear than the word investigation. Humans have natural defense mechanisms that resist being probed examine or scrutinize by any authority that has the power to discipline, sanction, or aspects of our life. And why is that? Maybe it's because, uh, you know, growing up and, and getting in trouble and we have this, you know, desire not to get in trouble or, or get yelled at. So, um, we don't want to be at fault even though no one is perfect. So let's look at some of the components of investigations. First, having to find fault where it exists. And this can be a very hard thing to do. Again, we're requiring to place blame on something. And an important thing to remember here is not only are we identifying faults, but is the fault something that's mechanical or is it human error or is it just one of those things where there's no one to blame it's just one of those um, like you know freak accidents or something of that nature all right so searching for and identifying the actions and contributing factors that allow an event to occur are basically a, a system of, of steps and when you look at these aspects and their occurrences, in order for a disaster to happen, you have to have a certain series of small events that alone, a lot of times, would not dictate a disaster. However, when they come together in chain, then, then you have, you know, your, your, your big time disaster, the house collapse, smoke explosion, wherever the case may be. But by identifying these little events or steps, we can prevent future events from happening. Simply enough, uh, for example, let's say um, giving people the power to say something if they see something unsafe and then that breaks the chain or doing morning checks uh, religiously regardless of well the truck hadn't turned uh, a wheel in three shifts and everything was here the last shift uh, you know if we can just break that one link then we can seriously prevent a disaster or something terrible from happening so we need to identify these components that contribute to um, the tragedy. Now going back to the life safety initiatives, initiative number nine calls for thorough investigation of all injuries, deaths, and near misses in an effort to reduce the chances of the next one occurring. Now the specific components of an effective system include reporting, 
investigating, evaluating, and implementing changes. And we're going to go into all these here a little bit later, more in depth. Now, if there was a fatality in a mine, you may consider an acceptable line of duty death uh, for a miner. However, the family and coworkers would want to know exactly what happened. The mining and insurance company have a vested interest in uncovering every factor that led to the explosion and ensuring that it does not happen again. Now, the Mine Safety and Health Administration investigates all mining fatalities and has investigating records going back well into the 1800s. Now, a thorough investigation doesn't assume anything. They should be seeking the root cause of the event, and once discovering that root cause, they must then eliminate it in future situations. In the 1930s, safety pioneer H.W. Heinrich introduced a theory linking unsafe acts to fatalities in the workplace. Utilizing our example of the welder, the theory would explain that hundreds of pressurized vessels might be repaired before one failure occurred, and that it may take several failures to lead to one severe injury or death. Now, the pyramid theory suggests what we already assumed. The more unsafe practices that occur, the more likely we are to have an injury or a line of duty death, which reduces unsafe practices and, of course, uh, reduced deaths. Other theories suggest that there is no absolute relation between unsafe acts and deaths because an unsafe act in itself can result in death. This argument suggests that it only takes one lottery ticket to win and that purchasing thousands of them does not ensure winning. Now regardless of which theory you believe, all of the theories suggest that unsafe practices must be identified and eliminated, whether it is the action of an individual or the overall incident management plan. Now, near-miss reporting, I, I do really love, there, there's plenty of websites out there, and I'll see about putting some on uh, in Blackboard for you, but near-miss reporting is a great way to anonymously put out there things that have happened and lessons learned from it. Now, the concept of near-miss affecting behavioral change is nothing new to humans. On a personal bias, we tend to learn more from our own near misses. In fact, the closer to catastrophe, the more likely we will take note and avoid the situation in the future. Now, the intent of Initiative 9 is not just to learn from an accident or a near miss, but to expose it so that everyone learns from it. There is often hesitation in claiming a near miss whether because of fear or retribution for breaking a rule or an embarrassing thing, making a bad decision or a foolish mistake. Now we need to put that aside and think about the greater common good for our brothers and sisters in the fire service. Hey, if I screwed up, I'm human. I know I screwed up. Let's put it out there. This is where I made the mistake so others don't make that mistake in the future. Advantages of near miss reporting. Now, numerous industries, excuse me, have identified the advantages of examining a near miss, sometimes called an incident with potential, or IWP. The British Medical Journal authors suggest one distinct advantage to using near miss data as a learning tool, rather than concentrating on unfavorable events such as injuries or death. A successful near-miss program comments all its resources on recovery. 
Now, the advantages of utilizing near-miss reporting system include plentiful data. It is presumed that near-miss data far outnumbers actual injury incidences. This suggests that they have the potential to be applicable in more situations and link to more contributing factors and could eliminate a significant number of future events. The next component is minimization of hindsight bias. A simple example of hindsight bias is I knew that was going to happen. Or, you know, maybe it's a armchair quarterback Monday thing. Oh, if I was in that situation, I would have done X, Y, Z. Proactive reporting, another component, utilizing near-miss information to prevent a future injury or death is a great example of being proactive. And again, I, I really hate the fact that in the fire service, it seems that we are more reactive than proactive, and that is a mindset that we need to change. Rather than you know, reacting to a disaster and changing things, why not preventing it? by again being proactive and that could be new technology new techniques protective gear whatever the case may be now we also have cost savings of timely reporting one of the most significant advantages of being proactive is that there is little or no actual damage or cost as a result of an incident now, I'm not saying that being proactive doesn't cost money, because uh, we all know it does, but comparing it to the disaster or an accident, you know, you're going to be saving money because that is going to cost a lot more, not only monetarily, but possibly in the loss of, of life as well. Finally, successful near miss reporting systems give immunity in most cases. Warning a firefighter might change the behavior of the few involved, but a properly used near miss program that has the potential of impacting the behavior of numerous firefighters and countless future events here is just really, really crucial. Components of near miss reporting. Now, several other industries have identified both the value of learning from near misses and the factors affecting the acknowledgement of an incident. Uh, an example being the Aviation Safety Reporting System, ASRS, listed in the text. Now, in 1995, the National Firefighter Near Miss Reporting System was created with the support of the International Association of Fire Chiefs. Now, it composed several important components. Voluntary reporting, confidential reporting, and non-punitive reporting. Now again, here's one of the websites and the one we're talking about at firefighternearmiss.com. Uh, there's another one like the Underground Network Near Miss Reporting and, and uh, several others to say the least. Now the reporting process. Reporting to the Firefighter Near Miss database is achieved by completing a handwritten or an online form as seen here. Now, there are five specific components to submitting a close call. One, the reporter information. Two, the incident information. Three, the event description. Four, lessons learned. And five, contact information. And again, this is not meant to be punitive at all. It's a way for them to get in contact, uh, 
answer questions or, or get more information if need be to have a, a, a complete and, and good report. And again, this is something that is non-punitive, meaning, hey, if you screwed up, you report it to them, others are going to learn from it, and you're not going to be held accountable. Well, I mean, from them anyway, you'll probably be held accountable uh, from your peers and coworkers and, of course, your bosses. Now that we've had taken a look at investigating our investigations and near misses, we are halfway to establishing a system that uses them to reduce injuries in the future. And in 1998, a study used statistics to suggest that although truck crashes versus car crashes were a relatively low percentage of all crashes, fatalities were higher than average. Now, regardless of fault, most statistics identified blind spots and sudden lane changes as two common occurrences that led to the crash. The trucking industry and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration both work to improve education on part of all drivers. Now, a complete system of crash investigations and the compilation of near-miss information were turned into an educational program that used stickers that we've all probably seen, we probably never realize it, on the back of semi-trailers to explain the potential blind spots and mud flaps to warn of wide turns. Now the following section presents an example of how several initiatives work together in investigating a near miss and the way it might look. For example, the event. Example, Crown Victoria in a crash with a semi-truck. Oil could have been brake fluid, crash could have been preventable, etc etc personal accountability which is initiative number two now human reaction is to downplay your role in the event even though you are the only one who is aware of it and it's hard trust me it is hard to stop the excuses but once you calm down and realize that you need to remain personally accountable, you decide you have an obligation to come forward with what you know. You know, and this goes back into the whole blame game. Oh, it's not my fault. Uh, you know, I backed the, uh, the fire truck into the bank so it was getting late. And, uh, you know, when Mike, he, he pulled it out to wash the fire truck, he didn't raise the door all the way up. Um, you know, it's his fault, not mine, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of examples of those excuses. But at the end of the day, okay, I screwed up or I have an obligation to tell what I know so we can prevent this from happening in the future. Sometimes we react to an event without a thorough investigation, but without it, you cannot prevent the next incident. When you call a chief to offer your information, you may be surprised to learn that the state police are investigating the crash. Uh, sometimes fire departments call the sheriff's department or state officials to conduct an investigation because an outside agency will probably be more thorough, it will not take anything for granted. Now, a department that is willing to cooperate with outside investigations shows organizational accountability. Uh, and of course, that's uh, initiative two. So that's like having NIOSH come in and looking at stuff or um, other federal agencies coming in uh, looking uh, at, at your records and see what happened. Or again, uh, maybe it's the state patrol to investigate a car wreck. 
or maybe it's OSHA coming in. Initiative 7, Data Collection and Research. During the investigation, statements are completed by your coworkers and, you know, for example, uh, the truck driver. With only a property damage crash, it is likely that law enforcement investigation will end at this point. But if the crash was not an accident, it was a crash and also a near miss because nobody was injured. The department needs to start its own investigation into all contributing factors and root causes. Researching similar incidences from the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, and the National Firefighter Near Emergency Reporting System database allows data to be collected and assembled into a form of information that can be used in the next steps. All right, so our next step is implementation, and this has to do with Initiative 5 and 11. Now, each of the 16 life safety initiatives are initiated to bring about action. Research, accountability, and empowerment are worthless unless they bring about change. Now, whether an event actually occurred or not, you know, accident versus near miss, the root cause and contributing factors must be assembled into a system to reduce the chances of it happening again. Now, chemical industry professionals recommend assembling the information gained from an investigation and near misses into what is known as leverage points, from which corrective actions can be instituted. Utilizing a system such as this would require results from all near miss reporting and accident investigations to be fed into a common system. That way you can start seeing trends. Uh, is the system working? Are we still having near misses? Um, did it create another problem? Now with the leverage points, a result of the near miss reporting would provide different layers of protection in the future. Now leverage points designating different levels of protection include the following. Level 1. It reduces the chance of future occurrence. Now this level takes the description of the event and attempts to eliminate the obvious cause. Now when multiple solutions are identified, they are lettered accordingly. Now, level two is provide a barrier. This step involves a safety net so that if an incident occurs, an injury is preventable. Unfortunately, this level sometimes requires obtaining additional equipment, which can take time and, of course, money. Level three. Protect against contributing factors. Now, contributing factors could be related to your actions and the environment aspect. Level four is providing a barrier for those contributing factors. Much like level two uses a barrier, assuming that the event will occur again and that proactive measures must be taken. Referencing level three actions guides us in developing plans for this level. Finally, level five, create an emergency response plan. The final level ensures that a contingency plan is in place in the event that all the other layers of protections have failed. Distribution of information. Now this is the final step in assembling leverage points into a format to distribute an actual institute change. Now a thorough system must use the information gathered to make changes to training materials, policies, and procedures. Now there are many avenues that are used to get the information out in specific formats. 
whether it be SOPs, SOGs, uh, informational videos, commercials, um, you know, stickers on the side of the trucks, uh, you name it. Another format is a NIOSH alert, which urgently requests assistance in preventing, solving, and controlling newly identified occupational hazards. NIST, if you've never been to the website, you need to because they are a wealth of information. Now, NIST research projects sometimes fall from a question or idea that develops due to statistics. And then they use research methods to prove or dismiss what firefighters believe to be true. And, you know, you can look at the NIST folks in terms of flow path. And, and training in the whole, um, you know, Governor's Island experiment or roof collapse. There's a wealth of information there for us to take full advantage of. Firefighter magazines, periodicals have long been an avenue for leaders to spread their knowledge and new ideas. Now, a new concept tends to start as such as a spot fire across the country and then when others pick up the idea and alter or add to it, uh, it it grows and it's you know phenomenal and it goes from east coast to west coast or vice versa and a good example of this is the denver drill and many of you probably have practiced this uh, in your career if you've been in there any length of time and you know that's a, a result from the you know Denver firefighters that ended up perishing in a fire because they had a down firefighter um, in a tight hallway and they were trying to get him up and out a window and you know they couldn't do it and they ended up you know losing life and losing men trying to get this person out. Now the firefighter websites are a quick way to spread information and solicit opinions. Of course, one disadvantage is the lack of accountability. Now, in addition to firefighter nearest reporting system website, there are three others that are directly related to initiative number nine. And that's the Everyone Goes Home website, Firefighter Close Call website, and the Wildland Firefighter Lesson Learn Center website. Again, these are all great resources to find out what people have learned possibly the hard way so we can learn from their mistakes and of course, um, try to prevent them from happening in the future. Textbooks are another example of disseminating information as a result of research. Unfortunately, textbooks, you know, that they don't roll out, you know, every other month. You know, they tend to sit on the shelf and, and take a minute to get upgraded. So they can be a little behind the times, unlike, you know, more of your electronic forms of media. Other great ways to get information out there are going to training seminars like FDIC or uh, Metro Atlanta. Um, oh gosh, what is it? it stands for? It's MAFC, uh, Metro Atlanta Firefighters Conference. And you start having people that bring their lessons that they've learned and they let everybody know about it and then people can build upon it and maybe they incorporate it. Uh, into their system, whether it be a 1002 driving course or, or some new training drill or some new technique. Now, of course, videos are a great way to demonstrate firefighter techniques or display fire growth. Near misses on video make a significant impression. So if you have somebody filming something, whether it be a training exercise or an actual event, and you have a near miss occurs, actually seeing that near miss in person really makes it hit home for the people watching it and thinking, hey, this could easily have been me. Okay, so in conclusion, this is a relatively short chapter, so let's sum up some key points. When we objectively look at the causes of firefighter injuries and deaths, we have access to three equally important sources of information. And that is the data provided in the line of duty death report, the injury data, and near miss reporting. 
it is important for us to use all three sources of data for the most accurate snapshot rather than concentrating exclusively on the line of duty death information. This is key because any injury or near miss could have been a fatality. Now injuries and near misses greatly exceed line of duty deaths. We need to do a better job of collecting and assembling, sorting and reviewing that information. Without comprehensive investigations of all components, followed by an equally effective distribution system, it will be difficult to learn from our past experiences, meaning the industry. If we don't share information, how can we learn from others' mistakes until we make the mistakes ourselves? So why do we need to reinvent the wheel? Investigations for fire and emergency service injuries result in a change in a policy or procedure. Now a near miss has the potential for serious consequence, but has for whatever reason avoided catastrophe. H.W. Heinrich suggested that workplace fatalities can be linked to unsafe acts. Advantages to near miss reporting include plentiful data, minimization of hindsight bias, proactive recording, and the cost of timely reporting and indemnity. Successful near miss reporting systems have key components such as voluntary, confidential, and of course, non-punitive. Firefighter near miss reporting utilizes reporting information, instant information, event descriptions, lessons learned, and contact information. Some industries suggest using those leverage points as a way to build in a safety system. After reporting, it is vital to, of course, dispute the information. Okay, gang, so if you have any questions, feel free to hit me up by email at aroberts at athenstech.edu or give me a call in the office at 706-357-0162. Make sure you go ahead and get your review questions and your objectives done. Until next time, be safe and have a good shift.